So here it is, 2017, and NASA just put out this video called Space Station Upgrades. Take a look at that. Look at that. Space Station. We're in outer space. Okay, that's great. That's great. Look at that. Floating around in an underground swimming pool, so forth and so on. But I'm going to show you some real proofs that you need to answer because NASA surely cannot, or they refuse to, one of the two. But I got to ask one thing, how is it a video about the moon can get almost a half a million views and there's so many people that go over there that spend their time watching this stupid video, but they also spend the time to leave comments, but they never want to leave any proof. Well, here's some, here's some questions that really need to be answered because it makes absolutely no sense. Now, let's be real because they're not just fooling us, they're fooling you too. You can continue moving forward in life, believing that we went through outer space and that the moon's going around the earth and the earth's going around the sun and we're all barreling through the atmosphere at ridiculous speeds, but it's not true. And they tell us that very often. Look at this little piece from Harvard right here and tell me what you see. Now let's start with Harvard real quick. This is Harvard's own website. See, Harvard Solar Engineering Research Program launches now in 2017. But let's take a look at the picture from outer space. Do you notice anything odd about the horizon? Just real quick. Let me just, that's their own footage, but I digress. Here's some more video from Harvard, which is from NASA. But do you notice anything strange in this picture? You see the sun coming up way over there and you see the earth right here? This is Harvard putting it right in your face. Just look at this real quick. I'm not going to say anything like flat earth or globe earth or anything, but look what you're seeing right now on Harvard's website from NASA. One more time. One more time. Look at this. Do you see that? Look at that. That's weird. Let's slow it down for the skeptics. Once again, Harvard through DC. Do you see the sun coming up over the earth? Wow, that's queer, huh? Indeed. Okay, so real quick, let's listen to the first landing on the moon, July 20th, 1969. Maybe it's not the first, but let's listen to the moon landing, July 20th, 1969. Let's listen to them as he's talking back and forth to Houston as he's landing on the moon. Hello, Eagle Houston, we're standing by over. Eagle Houston, we Houston, we see you on the stairwell. Over. Roger, Eagle, ten dot. Roger, how does it look? The Eagle, Eagle has wings. Roger. The Eagle has wings. On its own now, but with Columbia near at hand, it coasted around to the backside of the moon, and there, while out of direct communication with the Earth. It fired its engine to slow its descent to a touchdown on the near side of the moon. Collins in Columbia continued in orbit, awaiting their return. Okay, all flight controllers, gonna go for landing. Retro. Go. Fido. Go. Guidance. Go. Control. Go. Talcom. Go. GNC. Go. Econ. Go. Surgeon. Go. Capcom, we're go for landing. Altitude 4200. Houston, you're go for landing. Over. Roger, understand. Go for landing. 3,000 feet. You're looking great. How you doing, Control? We look good here. Fine. Roger, how about you, Talcom? Go. Guidance, you happy? Go. Fido. Go. 2,000 feet. 2,000 feet. Into the ag. 47 degrees. Roger. 37 degrees. Still looking very good. Here go. Top alarm. 1201. 1201. Roger. 1201 alarm. 1201 alarm. Same type. We're go flight. Okay, we're go. We're go. Same type. We're go. Altitude 1600. Eagle looking great. 
1202, we copy it. 35 degrees, 750, coming down to 23. 540 feet, down at 15. 1050 feet, down at 4. Altitude, velocity, light. Three and a half down, 220 feet. Coming forward, coming down nicely, 200 feet. Four and a half down, five and a half down. 100 feet, three and a half down, nine forward. 875 feet, that's looking good, down a half. Six forward. 60 seconds. Lights on, forward, forward, 40 feet down, two and a half, picking up some dust, straight shadow, four forward, drift into the right a little, 30 seconds, forward, just. contact light, okay, engine stop, we copy you down, Eagle, Houston, uh, Tranquility Base here, the Eagle has landed. And look at that, huh? Not only did it land perfectly upright, even though apparently the moon's moving and the spaceship's moving, but it somehow set itself down. But the one little thing NASA can't really explain is how come we couldn't hear the astronaut because he was on top of a rocket engine? They forgot to include the rocket engine in their little video cast. Do you see what I'm saying? Can anybody explain that? Well, no? Okay, great. Let's move on. Everybody loves to roll out people like Michio Kaku or Neil deGrasse Tyson. Whenever there's any type of doubt about the moon, the moon landing, the flags, what the flags were made out of, the crater that's not there from the lander that should surely be there because this is representative. See these large nozzles? That's a rocket engine. It's not a jet engine. It's not an engine like in a car. It's not an engine like in a boat. It's a rocket engine. And this is what a rocket looks like going up or landing, no matter what. But this is what they present us with. And it looks like nothing. It looks exactly like what it is. It's a sound stage. It's an absolute sound stage. And yes, it's a great big giant conspiracy, without a doubt. If a rocket just landed there, there would be a dune all the way around it. A crater, we'd call it. But I digress for now. Let's listen to Michio Kaku talk about going to the moon over and over and over. But first, let's listen to a scientist and what they actually really say to people in their own special language. Now, basically, the only new principle involved is that instead of power being generated by the relative motion of conductors and fluxes, it is produced by the modial interaction of magneto-reluctance and capacitive directance. The original machine had a base plate of prefamulated amulite surmounted by a malleable logarithmic casing in such a way that the two spurving bearings were in a direct line with a panometric fam. The latter consisted simply of six hydrocoptic marzal veins so fitted to the ambifacient lunar wane shaft that side fumbling was effectively prevented. Now that may be comical, but still. That is the language that they speak in. They speak in their own arcane language, and there's no two ways about that. And people just drool over it. This guy in a white jacket is just so darn smart. You see what I'm saying? We have astronauts claiming they couldn't see any stars at all. And then turn the page, we have, NAS we have astronauts saying they could see all sorts of stars. We have Michio Kaku telling us that the the flag was made out of certain aluminum foil materials and it was meant to look like it was waving. And then we have them saying that it was simply picked off a store shelf for $5. It was a regular old made in America, American flag. It's very difficult to tell the truth when everything is a lie, but we are cracking the surface. And that's easily, you can easily tell that's occurring by looking in the comment section with the very, very angry NASA people jumping up and down, explaining in their fantastic vocabulary exactly how stupid I am and how quickly I should die. But let's listen to the Potter's Clay YouTube channel's top 10 NASA moon landing hoax proofs, we'll call them. And links will be in the description. NASA admitted that it had lost, lost the original footage of man's first steps on the moon. 
a YouTube and watch a funny thing happened on the way to the moon. It contains newly discovered evidence, which is part of the missing tapes, of outtakes from the first mission to the moon of them falsifying a shot of being halfway to the moon. We found never before seen footage of them faking part of the photography, which is in a funny thing happened on the way to the moon, which has been licensed five times and can only now be viewed on YouTube. Here they discuss the fact that they have turned out the lights and have blocked out sunlight from entering the spacecraft through the other windows as to not cause any reflected light to fall onto the spacecraft's wall in the foreground. Okay, very good. Well, we shut out the sun coming in some of the other windows into the spacecraft, so uh, it's looking through a, uh, the uh, number one window and there isn't any uh, reflected light. The reason this was done is so that the truth of the matter would not be revealed. It is this. Though the federal government would have you believe that this is a view of Earth from a distance out of the spacecraft's window as it nears the moon, it is not. What they have ingeniously done is placed the camera at the back of the spacecraft and centered the lens on a circular window in the foreground, outside of which it is completely filled with the Earth in low orbit. The circumference of the window then appears to be the diameter of the Earth at a distance. As they perfected the shot, a crescent-shaped piece of black material was inset slightly into the window to create the illusion of the Earth's terminator line dividing night and day. It is uncannily convincing. During this segment, intended to be edited and played back later for the worldwide television audience, dated July 18, 1969, Neil Armstrong condemns himself as he states that he is 130,000 miles out. Roger, Houston, Apollo 11. Calling in from about 130,000 miles out. Finally, the iris is opened up and you can see the real location of the camera and the very bright and near Earth out the window. Here is the slate for the 19th of July and the same shot of trickery on the 19th of July and then the 20th and the same misleading shot on the 20th. Later that evening they were said to be walking on the moon. How can this be when they were in Earth orbit only nine hours earlier and the moon is some three days journey away? So I took a year and I traveled across the country and folks, I've actually posted it on YouTube. It's called Did We Go? And the challenge is, Geraldo, everywhere I went, it was just amazing. Moon rocks falling in Antarctica, Neil Armstrong's silence. But I was the first to report, and you played the clip earlier tonight, that all the science data, the telemetry data was missing. Now, Geraldo, for NASA to come out and say that all the tapes were erased, I mean, you must, it's incredible. Geraldo, this isn't just one tape. This is rooms of tape labeled Apollo 11 moon landing. Someone had to physically go and erase it. It's very challenging to try to prove we landed on the moon, and it shouldn't be challenging. That should be there. There should be plenty of evidence. Now, in this video, he shows really, really, in a common sense fashion, if you have a girlfriend or you, if you have a spouse, you realize how much hair ends up in the bathroom, ends up in the shower. Yet on, on the International Space Station, apparently there's no rules at all. You can be in terrible shape, still go up to the space station. You can have your hair hanging out absolutely everywhere. This is obviously fakery, and it's not even good fakery, to put it bluntly. It's so ridiculous how often you can catch these people lying and then how often you can catch the CGI. It's just beyond pathetic. I'm going to leave links in the description so you can keep following this. But the Potter's Clay YouTube channel does a phenomenal job, in my, in my opinion, and he doesn't have enough followers. At any rate, Richie from Boston, here's just a few for all of those people that can't seem to wrap their head around it that their government lies to them. Actually, let me throw in two more real quick. Now, in 1986, I was what? I think uh, 19 years old, okay? Is that right? 67? Whatever. I never said I was a mathematician. 
The problem is I remember this happening and everybody was so broken up. But if you put just a little tiny bit of effort into it, you'll find out not only was that explosion a hoax, none of these people died. And the way you can tell that none of these people died is they're all still alive and easily identifiable. And as a matter of fact, most of them didn't even change their names. And all of them have prestigious jobs, exactly like you would suspect they would after being involved in an enormous hoax like the Columbia exploding. You see what I'm saying? The challenger, my mistake. It's hard keeping all this stuff straight, just to tell you the truth. And I don't do very much editing, but I digress. At any rate, listen to this. Six, the shuttle Challenger exploded about 74 seconds after takeoff, killing all seven astronauts inside. Or did it? It turns out that six of the seven are still alive and kicking today. Ellison Onizuka claims to be his identical twin brother, Claude. Yeah. Now, I know a lot of you guys are really good at the detective work. Look at these people. Look at their expressions. Look at the facial bone structure. It's clearly and obviously them. And that's how the elites work. They love letting us know that they pulled stuff off. Because there's no, there's no consequences. They can simply just smother the rumor with the media that they bought a long time ago. Moving on. I've got an identical twin brother, Claude, too. The Challenger pilot, Mickey Smith, hasn't even bothered changing his name. He's now Professor Michael J. Smith of University of Wisconsin. Now, Krista McAuliffe was a bit of a sneaky one. She was the Challenger payload specialist, quite famous for being a teacher. It turns out, during her astronaut days, she was using her middle name, Krista. And now she goes by her first name, Sharon. And she's a Syracuse law professor. The Challenger commander, Francis Richard Scobie, is now Dick Scobie, which sounds like a rather unpleasant disease, the CEO of Cows in Trees Limited. Judith Resnick, the Challenger Mission Specialist, again, hasn't even bothered changing her name. She's a professor at Yale Law. And finally, Ronald McNair, another Challenger Mission Specialist, claims to be his identical twin brother, Carl McNair. What are the odds? Now look at these people. Look at the space. Look at the upside down pyramid that forms on her forehead. And it's still right there. Look at the smile, the dimples, the nose. The same thing with this handsome fellow. Look at the lazy eyes. They're right there. Look at the width between the eyebrows. It's the same thing. It's exactly like the crap they pulled in Sandy Hook where people played multiple. I'm a grieving father, but I'm also a SWAT team member. You see what I'm saying? They love jamming this in our faces because most people are too busy looking at their cell phones, paying their bills, or not raising their children. It's a busy time to be alive. Now, here's another thing that I almost forgot, and I just made a comment about it not too long ago. This is explained by Michael Straub YouTube channel. The link will also be in the description. In order to reach the moon, astronauts had to pass through what is known as the Van Allen radiation belt. The belt is held in place by Earth's magnetic field and stays perpetually in the same place. The Apollo missions to the moon mark the first ever attempts to transport humans through the belt. People contend that the sheer levels of radiation would have cooked the astronauts en route to the moon, despite the layers of aluminum coating to the interior and exterior of the spaceship. Now, I don't know how many times I've shown this, but again, I'm going to show it once again. They've admitted on more than one occasion how they're still testing so that they can get humans through the Van Allen radiation belt. We are headed 3,600 miles above Earth, 15 times higher from the planet than the International Space Station. As we get further away from Earth, we'll pass through the Van Allen belts, an area of dangerous radiation. Radiation like this could harm the guidance systems, onboard computers, or other electronics on Orion. Naturally, we have to pass through this danger zone twice, once up and once back. But Orion has protection. 
Shielding will be put to the test as the vehicle cuts through the waves of radiation. But Orion has protection. Shielding will be put to the test as the vehicle cuts through the waves of radiation. Now, if they did this back in the late 60s, they don't have to test anything. It should have been improved tenfold by now. But that's not the case. Now, what this young fella in the rumor I've heard is that he's no longer with us. He's taken his own life. That's the rumor that I heard. I cannot verify it, even though I have tried. This young fella believes he's talking to an audience that's not really listening. He believes that the medication, vaccinations, and fluoridation has taken effect and the dumbing down of America is complete. And perhaps all those pesky jerk-offs that were still alive when this allegedly occurred the first time have all passed away. Sadly, they have not. Now, finally, let me throw this one in there for those that love to leave comments but don't seem to do any research. NASA was wholly manned by Nazi scientists that should have been put up on trial for war crimes, but instead found a cushy job here in the United States helping NASA pretend to go to the moon. And they did a great job. Let's check them out. We really want to understand what's going on in space today and what's happening with the plan to put weapons in space. I think it's instructive to go back and understand the origins of the U.S. space program. And to do that, you have to go back to Nazi Germany. Hitler recruited a brilliant young rocket scientist by the name of Werner von Braun, who had a weekend rocket club, to come to work for the Nazis to build the V-1 and V-2 rockets that were used to terrorize the cities of London and Paris and Brussels towards the end of World War II. And for von Braun and his team, uh, they set up along the Baltic Sea a place called Pinamunde. It was a research and development center for the Nazi rocket operation. And to this place at Pinamunde, the Nazis brought thousands of Jews and French resistance fighters to serve as prisoners, essentially slaves, to build this production effort. Well, the British found out about it, went in and bombed the entire operation. And so the Nazis said, we've got to move to a more secure location. And down inside of central Germany, there's a mountain chain called the Hartz Mountains. And in that mountain, there's a huge tunnel where the Nazis were storing military hardware. Well, they cleared the whole thing out, moved the entire rocket operation into the tunnel, named it Middlework. And just outside the mountain tunnel at Middlework, the Nazis built a brand new concentration camp called Dora. And to Dora, the Nazis brought 40,000 Jews, gypsies, French resistance fighters, homosexuals, communists, even a black American GI were brought there to serve as slaves for the operation. Well, you know, immediately after the war, the U.S. and the Allies created the Nuremberg Trials, at which time we brought the Nazis to justice for their crimes against humanity. But 1,500 of the top Nazis never went to trial. They were smuggled into the United States by the U.S. military in a, under a program called Operation Paperclip, smuggled in through Boston and West Palm Beach, Florida. And Werner von Braun and his rocket team, a hundred of them, along with 100 copies of the V-2 rocket, were sent to Huntsville, Alabama, where von Braun became the first director of NASA's Marshall Space Flight Center. What's interesting is the other 1,400 Nazis, who were they? Well, some of them were brought to the United States to work for the CIA. Others were brought to the United States to do the LSD drug experiments and the MK Ultra Mind experiments during the 1960s where people were jump, jumping out of windows. Some of the uh, Nazi scientists that in Germany had been taking Jews and putting them in freezing temperatures to see how the body would react to that were sent to Wright-Patterson Air Force Base in Ohio and were put in charge of the U.S. military flight medicine program. And so when you uh, take 1,500 of the top Nazi scientists and essentially seed the military-industrial complex, the question I have is do they bring with them an ideological contamination? And this is Werner Braun Braun's headstone. And it looks like 
Mr. Braun was leaving us a little clue right there in the form of Psalm 19.1. And according to the King James Version, the heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Any other questions or comments, you really, really may want to understand that some of us have looked into this to the nth degree. I was a firm follower of space, NASA, and all things star, planet, other, gal other galaxy related my entire life. Until one day, while looking through a telescope, I realized what I was looking at is, was, was not what they described to me whatsoever. Stars in no way are smaller, more distant suns, because if you work out the math for light years, we would be seeing things that were either there a long time ago or haven't even been there yet. This is a star through a telescope. Everything they have told us is a lie. And in my opinion, in my opinion only, I'm not pushing this on anyone. This is what I believe. They are simply and only trying to hide God. And I also firmly believe the reason they built CERN is because they can't go up. So they're going other dimension. And that's it. They're basically kicking the side door out of the firmament because they can't go up. At any rate, all the links will be in the description. This is Richie from Boston. And I'm out. And one more time for the rest of the class. This is Harvard's website. This is a picture of the sunrise over the Earth from NASA. Do you notice anything that's missing? Exactly. They didn't use the fisheye lens this time. Like, share, subscribe, or don't. I'm out.